Okay, check, check. I think we are live. We are live. Testing one, two, three. Daryl, want to say hello to everybody? Hello. All right, <laughs> levels are looking good. Great, awesome. All right, sorry for that little bit of, uh, uh, we're just doing some technical adjustments here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I'm Brett, and this is Lauren. We Hi. are H&R Studio, and uh, we are joined today by Daryl. Who I'm really excited to hear about. Yeah, we've um, been geeking out over this. <laughs> um, I just want to go through a few technical things first before I let Lauren do the real introduction. Uh, but uh, please use the chat bar on the side of the screen to ask us any questions. We won't really be addressing or answering the questions until about eight o'clock. Uh, but you know, please please feel free to go ahead and you know throw those questions out there as you think of them and also let us know if there are any technical things that we should be aware of. Uh, as of right now, it looks like our audio levels are good and uh, our image is going out nice and clear, good connection. So uh, mm. we would love to hear if, if YouTube is lying to me here. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'll pass it over to Lauren. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Daryl, and then I'm just going to open everything up to him. This is, this is I'm not exaggerating when I say this is a pretty momentous occasion. So we really hope that this intro, Daryl, does you justice. So um, ignore me while I look off to the side. I'm going to read it from another screen, because as you guys find out, Daryl is a very, very accomplished guy, and there's a lot, there's a lot to read about you. So obviously, guys, this is Daryl, Daryl Keith Babatunde Smith. Someone whom we've had the pleasure of knowing for quite a few years now. Um, Daryl is a draftsman, Daryl is a classicist, and Daryl's a polyglot. Um, he informed me exactly what that word meant not long ago. He's fluent in several languages, and not just briefly, he really studies and utilizes them, which is really, really impressive. He obtained his BFA in painting from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and his MFA in drawing with an anatomy concentration from the New York Academy of Art. Daryl creates silver point drawings. Obviously, I'm no fan of those. Uh, often enhanced by egg tempera, influenced by ancient Greece and Rome, which, as you guys will find out, we'll get to in a moment tonight. Daryl's works have been exhibited in New York and Europe and are currently en route to be in an exhibition in Athens, Greece. And while that's just the textbook introduction to Daryl, I want to speak for just a minute more about tonight's panel before giving the floor to him as um, our format is a little bit different. Tonight's panel is more of a public lecture or like a thesis presentation because Daryl's going to be discussing body as language. This is basically a compendium of what Daryl, like literally eight years of observation and annotation of the connection between figurative art language in the ancient Greek world. From um, the description of this panel, Daryl will quote, discuss the ancient Greek use of the body and art as visual language and how this visual language coincided with written and spoken language at the time Daryl will later examine how profound an impact the ancient Greeks and Romans had on figurative art in the Western tradition of art and how the legacy lives on today. So to say that this lecture is relevant to contemporary figurative artists is an understatement. And as far as we're aware, it's the very first of his kind, which is why, Daryl, we're like really honored and really, really giddy to have you with us. <laughs> so, but the other thing I want everyone watching to be aware of is obviously we've been, we're pretty pumped about this. Um, but we also, also want to be, I'm literally tripping over my words. I'm, I'm, I'm like, my knees are bouncing like crazy off, off the screen, you can't see. Um, we do, however, want to be very respectful of the fact that Daryl is not simply having a casual conversation with us, but rather that you are sharing the, the end result of eight years of work in research that you've done here for the first time. And when we started discussing the, this uh, panel, we knew that you had bigger plans to teach and share this work. So we want to be very um, respectful of the fact that these are your original concepts. And again, that you're the only artist we know of who's connected these particular dots. For that reason, while we're so honored to have Daryl here, we don't want to impede on his potential to utilize the information he'll be sharing 
in the programs he's currently working on privately on his own time, which you can learn about through his website. Um, so that being said, please do not be surprised if at some point in the future, this live stream gets tunca truncated or edited to ensure that Daryl retains full use of his content. So that's a little bit different than our usual format. And again, if you go to Daryl's website, you'll see a page introduction, which has a little information about those programs as they're coming out. Um, so I really don't have any planned questions for you, Daryl. We're just like, we're just happy to let you go. So we, we figured, like Brett said, we we just, it's all yours until like 8 o'clock. Um, from like 8 to 8.30, if people have questions, they can type them in the comments section. And yeah, it's just a matter of where you want to start and telling us about all the research and work that you've been, I'm just, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just so excited. So <laughs> Um, well, I'm very happy to be uh, talking about this uh, culminative thesis work that I've been working on for the past mm -hmm. uh, eight years. I, I, you know, I, I'll start off with the language aspect of it. You know, I, mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know me or my work, I primarily am really interested in the Greco-Roman world, um, primarily Greek though, um, by mm -hmm. way of not only their like mythology, but their their literature, the language and um, philosophy and their art. Um, and I always thought it was very interesting that we still study these things today. I always found it very interesting that in museums, there are sculptures and mosaics and paintings um, done by the ancient Greeks and Romans and in schools too, in art schools, especially the one that I went to, uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, I was really captivated by the cast hall. And it wasn't just because of the, you know, 18th century, 19th century French academic tradition of drawing casts. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit more than that because it felt like in each of these cast sculptures, there was something greater that was being discussed, yet we weren't discussing them. Mm. Uh, and I knew, you know, there was, there, was, there was something there. And that is what I was always questioning, um, kind of getting out of the academic side of things, but kind of asking, you know, okay, this is a cool cast. I love how it's lit. But like, why is it made? Like, who did it? Why are these forms, you know, composed in this fashion? Why, you know, why is this arm here? Why is this mm -hmm. sculpted like this? Why, you know, all these whys. And I didn't have any answers, but the only thing I could really do was just sit down and look at them really, really carefully. And so I, uh, if you want to go to the first image, actually, yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. what I'll be um talking about uh so i drew like right after i graduated i <laughs> had the i was so fascinated by the sculpture in the cast hall but, but i never drew it as a student mm -hmm. and you know i looked at it every day coming from work and kind of just staring at the forms and it really captivated me. So I, you know, I, I had to draw it, but again, I wasn't really drawing this in the mindset of completing a cast drawing because I don't think a cast drawing really would have treated rendering this uh, sculpture as a sculpture, as like a, as a, as a sculpture, an object as it is in terms of it being a cast sculpture that has a certain type of finish on it with its mm -hmm. cavities and depressions and whatnot. Um, I didn't care about the lighting situation mm -hmm. as one would in a proper cast drawing. I just really cared about drawing it for what it was and kind of figuring out what is it about this that is calling to me. Now, this sculpture is uh, of Alyssus. Alyssus mm -hmm. is a river god. And I was like, okay. I don't really get it but you know the you know you'll 
something that I realized too, primarily by way of studying the language, they're very particular about the words that they use. They have very, very, very specific words. Um, and with that in mind, with knowing how specific the Greeks were with their lexicon, I was coming to this sculpture like, okay, there's something really specific about this. I don't know what it is. I'm gonna sit down and draw it and figure it out. Um, as I drew it, I realized that the forms of the body were being used to mimic the flow of water. Mm -hmm. God. And, hmm. and I only really understood that not even by like kind of chasing the shadows as you do in a cast drawing, mm -hmm. but like really feeling with the pencil. Then, and then also this is after, you know, a year of anatomy mm -hmm. studies in the undergraduate program that I had too. But I'm like, you know, I'm like feeling this form down from like the, the trapezius that's, you know, where it's kind of cut off where the head is no longer there. Mm -hmm. From the trapezius down to the center line where the sternum is you know, over a couple of the ribs in the pectoralis and down over the costal arch. And then it goes, it follow. you know, it, it topographically speaking, as you're mm -hmm. going down this form, yeah, yeah. It, it does this like waterfall cascading from rock sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah. I think this is what, I think this is what it is. It mm -hmm. feels very deliberate. Mm -hmm. It feels very, very deliberate, these forms. And, and that's what kind of stuck in my head for many, many years. And yeah, it was just, it was just amazing. I couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't stop thinking about that. Just that simple aspect of like, oh my goodness, they're literally just like translating a natural phenomenon and putting it within the constraints of the human figure. Oh, that's a huge monumental wow. concept. And that meant yeah. a lot. It meant yeah. a lot. And I was like, okay, you know, I was like, okay, oof, let me simmer down. Let me simmer down. <laughs> yeah. um, and now if you go to the next image, uh, 1B. Um, so this is a, this is a close up of, the, there's a sarcophagus in the Met in the Greco-Roman section. If you walk and you go all the way back, there's four balls that it, that like four black marble balls that this sarcophagus is sitting on. Oh my God, it's amazing. And on the, you know, it's like, is it about, Di I don't know what it's about. I think it's about Dionysus and like the four seasons or something like that. But on the right hand side, this is what it looks like. And mm -hmm there's this reclining male figure there again. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's the same, it's the same thing. So now we're using, you know, the previous knowledge from the other sculpture that I talked about. I'm like, okay, man is cascading or man is like reclining, cascading, mm -hmm. probably a river god. Oh. And, you know, I'm like, okay, now if you look all the way at the bottom left, you can see a little bit of water flowing out. Okay. Like a vessel. Mm -hmm. So this is the personification uh. of ocean. Mm. Um, and on the other side of the sculpture, it's a female reclining. Um, and that is the personification of earth. Oh my God. Um, because she's literally coming out of the earth. You know, how connected can you be to the earth? Yeah. You know? You're just literally connected to it. And, yeah. You know, sounds sounds silly when you say it like that, but it's true. It's like, yeah. like what what happens. So I'm looking at this figure and I'm like, oh my gosh. It's a river god, totally. I get it. Yeah. Cascading, done, you know. Yeah. And then he has like the lobster horns as like yeah, lobster claws as horns. Yeah. You have the little water flowing out of the vessel there to his left. Yeah. So that completely uh, supported the uh, hypothesis that I had when I was drawing the Alyssa sculpture in cast. Mm -hmm. And and again, I simmered on that. Mm -hmm. I simmered on it. Until last year, 
Um, last year, I had a, a really great opportunity to go to Athens, Greece for a residency at mm -hmm. Athena Standards Residency. It was amazing. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I did the residency because I was really inspired by cycladic art, which mm -hmm. is something new, and I kind of wanted to get a feeling for what cycladic art was. But, you know, being in Athens, you're obviously exposed to lots of different art, both ancient and contemporary. Mm -hmm. And I went to the, the National Archaeological Museum in Athens was about a 20 minute walk from the place I was staying in Athens. So of course I went there frequently. Uh -huh. And um, if you go to, to image number two, um, I found, I was, you know, mm -hmm. walking through the museum mm -hmm. and I saw this image. As I walked into the gallery in the museum and I saw this sculpture from the corner of my eye and I was like, oh my God, I know who it is. I know. Like, like my gut feeling, like I was like, I feel it. I really, I really know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, why, why do I know? I didn't go up close to read the plaque yet. I was still mm -hmm. far away. I was like, I'm going to test this. Okay. And I saw it. I was like, oh. And it felt like, it felt like I won Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> uh <laughs> because because you know because i feel like because the language that the greeks used were so specific mm -hmm. similarly to even in english when you have a word with letters missing and you know and understand the language and speak the language to a point mm -hmm. you can fill in the words no matter what letters are missing yeah right? mm -hmm. so yeah that same thing applies to how i see fragments like i don't see mm. fragments as a, like incomplete work mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it is technically a incomplete work in that it is a section of a whole but i feel like even then the word is so strong mm -hmm. um and so specific that no matter what aspect of the body is there i think that the word or the theme is still very clear. I had a critique once in grad school and the the critic said, why is like, I was drawing a fragment and they're like, oh, why does this figure have like no arms or no head? I'm like, well, think about it. If you were to draw a self-portrait, how much of yourself would you be able to draw before you recognize that it's, it's yourself, right? Like mm -hmm. I could draw like an eye and know that it's myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that same idea applies to these fragments. So I saw this across the room, this sculpture, and I was like, it's Athena, done. You know, <laughs> I was like, okay, why though? Okay, so <laughs> Athena in ancient Greek literature is described as being fully armed and you know, her biggest, um, her birth scene, right? You see that a lot. Mm -hmm. So when Athena was born, she was born like straight out of the head of Zeus. Like she came and she's like, you know, rushing out, fully <laughs> armed, spear, you know, yeah. uh, shield at the ready. She like was ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, and because she has a shield and she, you know, is in combat. She does uh, close combat fighting. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you wouldn't really have the shield, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so looking at this, I'm like, okay, there's a figure wearing a sort of dress that goes all the way down to the feet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be a woman of some sort. Uh, who could it be? Aphrodite. Uh, uh, Diana, Athena, Amazonian woman, like, I don't know. So, mm -hmm. um, but then, but then there's, then there's um, the knee, which is like. Yeah, it's very wow. interesting. The knee for me is very interesting. And that's something I will be going in depth with. So the knee is a, I feel when the knee is in this position, 
where it's bent and not necessarily touching the ground plane because again the greeks are very specific about the ground plane um it's not quite touching the ground plane it's like so close to being there but it's very suspenseful right Mm -hmm. and it and i feel like it's a sign of um being oppressed by another stronger entity Mm. and pushing you down Mm -hmm. but the other entity the entity that's being you know beaten or oppressed is also strong too right Mm -hmm. so they're having this battle back and forth but the other person's pushing them down and pushing this really strong person down so far that they're almost touching the ground which is Mm -hmm. where the suspense happens because the other person could just like you know come back up kind of like an arm wrestle like an arm wrestling match yeah when you're when you like beat that you're almost there you're not yeah yeah the ground yet but so close that tension i feel is Mm -hmm. all set in that move so Mm -hmm. there's a fight happening right because of that move. so that's what i'm kind of inferring okay Mm -hmm. so there's a fight happening there's some woman fighting this other giant thing because gods are not only human sized but they're also greater than human sized um and so i'm looking at this and I'm like, hmm. So this woman's fighting someone rather closely. So it's not going to be Diana because Diana has a bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. And because Diana's running through the forest, she's not going to have the dress go past her knees mm-hmm. because she needs to move quickly. Mm-hmm. Same with the Amazonian woman who also has a spear, who is also running around, who isn't going to have a garment that will fall past their knees because they need to be quick and nimble. Mm-hmm. so i'm like it's athena athena has the, the the shield close combat fighting yeah and you know it's athena fighting a giant and i went up to the plaque and i was like oh my god you know, right. uh, oh my god that's 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 it's crazy and, yeah look i'm gonna take a step i'm gonna take a step foot, the way she launches her foot yeah the left foot there mm. the way that's angled She's mm-hmm. using a, some some great force, but then you see her her right foot is pretty like flat on the ground, sturdy. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. very very sturdy. You will often see her if not if she's not exerting force, she's usually really rigid and just standing there. Mm-hmm. Um, a sentinel. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. So, wow, that's that incredible. Made me really happy, and so then you know to the next one image three Mm -hmm. okay Uh, first of all daryl i i know everybody watching is here because they appreciate your expertise but the fact that you you made such specific identifications that it was athena that it wasn't just another random warrior but rather a giant that's 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 exactly why we have you here. <laughs> that's exactly why we were so excited. Because that's... But it, like, blew my mind. Yeah, well, was, my mind like, too. No way. I was like, I totally, like, it feels like Wheel of Fortune. It literally feels like Wheel of Fortune. And I'm, like, sitting there, I'm like, I know. Yeah. Like, I know. Yeah. yeah. No, um, it, it, it's... it turned out to be correct, but I'm using these, these clues that are from, you know not only the iconography in terms of like the images that you see plastered around, but then also just how they're described in the language too. Mm -hmm. They're so specific. And I think that Mm -hmm. specificity should also be translated into all of the arts because it was all connected. And that's the advantage that you have over someone who's just like a rote art historian because they, a lot of them can look and observe, but as you know, the language aspect of it probably more thoroughly than I would imagine the overwhelming majority of maybe I'm really getting myself into trouble saying this but I I would think you you have an advantage because when you know the language and two you can draw the image yourself you can create the image yourself you can put practice to theory I would think that 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 just sharpens all of your observational abilities 
to make that ident other people might arrive at that identification, but that you can do it much more quickly. Like you said, it just it was this gut feeling. You just knew you could you could just synthesize all of your different experiences instantaneously and know. And I think that's what makes your observation so so poignant and so singular. Because again, I I don't I don't know anyone else who has the myriad experiences you have at the depth at which you have them that would allow you to arrive at that conclusion that quickly with with so much resolve and accuracy obviously yeah so. it, it, it's um yeah it's a it, it's yeah it shows that you're fluent in this visual language that uh is 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 um uh I'm, um, uh, is very is very rare. I mean, uh, we 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 um, uh, we just don't. I mean, I don't know. Do we use um, you know visual symbols to quite the same same um, uh, way in in uh, in our in our contemporary culture? Mm -hmm. I'm I, I'm I'm trying to think, think of so. you know kind of an analogous visual culture that we have, um, but it's you know probably just some sort of I don't know commercial or you I don't know, think cartoon. so I don't think so <laughs> yeah I don't think, I, like I don't feel that it's totally the same like, yeah yeah I don't feel like it is as purposeful if that mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like like when I think about composing a figure I literally think about like like almost like writing a novel to the point where mm -hmm. like if your fingers here versus here, there should be a reason. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. outside of just composition, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Hmm. And 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 so I I start looking at the stuff. I'm like, oh, this arm is pronated a little bit. What does that mean? You know, um, like if you take the Alyssa sculpture, the first image, um, and if you were to take the torso mm -hmm. and turn it so the face wouldn't so the torso instead of facing you know to the front it would be facing more towards the ground mm. Mm -hmm. that's a totally different image mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. like That's a not... dying warrior pose right. yeah I was, I was gonna say right. then I, I would think of like the, the dying gall a little bit Gaul, yeah, more yeah, so yeah exactly than... exactly so if you like if you take that if you take that image and just like just twist it and then twist it and then twist it down that's all like that's a whole other word mm -hmm. at this mm. point mm. and that's um, and that's and that's why again your work is so interesting because it's not just a whole other image. It's not just a whole other artwork. It's a whole other word, you know, and that, that intersection again, that you're, that you're able to, to identify is I think really so crucial. I'm sorry. We interrupted you. No, 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 <laughs> I was no, like, no, I just no, want no, you to go, no, but no, like, it's oh, so interesting to talk about it. Um, if we go to where are we? The third image. Yes. Then, yep, we are. Um, uh so this is from the pergamon sculpture uh God. again we have athena in the mm -hmm. center there mm -hmm. fighting someone i don't know who unfortunately but the person's related to gaia who is that woman coming out of the ground to the right mm -hmm. um the person that Athena is attacking is that has that same knee. Mm hmm. It's the same. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. And there's the an... other leg that's stretched out mm -hmm. is stretching towards his mom. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's that same that symbol same of knee. that knee under, under mm -hmm. the word skirt, the word dress. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So that same knee is there. And then the next image, um, image four, is what kind of made me think of the knee. Um, and and you see oh. this in, in various types of uh, 
images with the same theme of Theseus fighting the Minotaur. In oh, okay. Or um, in this one, like you see that Theseus is like holding him down. Like the Minotaur is like, it's the Minotaur. Yeah, right? yeah. That's a beast. Like it's yeah. powerful. And so, and so Theseus is like using his, like all this man strength to, to like destroy this beast. And we, and we see that knee mm -hmm. and we see how they, they drew the ground plane there. They mm -hmm. drew it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They see that the foot, both of their feet are touching the ground plane. Mm -hmm. But we see that knee isn't. Mm -hmm. right. It's so close to being there, but it's yeah. not there. And yeah. I think that's that same like arm wrestling sort of analogy that I made before. But that knee, I feel, is what made me think of Athena in the in the fighting I was like oh my gosh like whoever mm -hmm. this person is fighting is like powerful um so it's obviously going to be a goddess uh because this person's wearing a skirt so mm -hmm. or dress rather and yeah it was it just like blew my mind so I thought mm -hmm. of this vase painting when I thought of the knee and and now it just really comes up everywhere the yeah knee. Yeah, and and you can start to see it in some Florentine art too. Mm. Hmm. Uh, though they and then they take that as a construct and then just like right. change, like they do some crazy stuff with it because you know the the Renaissance and the sculptures yeah. specifically they do some like crazy wild things and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but it has the same structure that I feel has roots in this knee, um, even in like the next image uh image what is that mm -hmm. image five yeah um this is uh perseus uh killing medusa and the knees there too mm -hmm. and all these are from different time periods mm -hmm. but that knee is still very constant and i think mm -hmm. that is is quite amazing and we you know we know it's a different time just by the style of yeah the way that it's sculpted but that knee is still there Mm -hmm. And I think that is, for me, a very, a very important um, thing uh, to know in terms of how, how mm -hmm. just little body parts can mm -hmm. actually yeah. say a lot. And right. I think then I, for, for anatomy, I often say like anatomy is the grammar of the human body mm -hmm. and like once you take that grammar, you can really do a lot with it. You can make like a surrealist poem by um, elongating figures. Yeah. You can you can allude to a story by you know changing the knee position and twisting something. You know, mm -hmm. but every every little thing, uh, every little thing, every you know muscle, bone, mm -hmm. uh, ligament. Uh, joint in the body has grammatical potential to be used to tell some sort of a narrative within the human body that is that represents something outside of the human body mm -hmm. um, and I think the Greeks were so good at that. Um, that that makes sense given you know just as we were discussing before before we we made this live stream you know, live is, you know, um, all the different layers of meaning that the Greeks put into their works. And again, that's the advantage you have having studied not just language in general, but ancient Greek, you know, and, and, and that the fact that you even have a page of translations on your website, you know, it really, like, if I walked up to the placard, maybe I could approximate this. <laughs> But I've never, you know, it would never be like, no pun intended, fleshed out to the degree right. to which to which you're doing it again, because you're not just an art historian, you're not just an artist, you're not just a linguist, you're not just a classicist, you're not just an intellectual, you you combine all these different areas of expertise again, it's this it's this um it's it's so it's so awesome to have you here speaking to us because you're not just obs you're not just observing you're you're demonstrating 
um, like a synthesized observation, which I think actually goes so, it really reaches a lot of the academic ideals of the ancient world. Like, I think, I think that's to me, from what I understand, that's what they would have considered like a pinnacle of, of intellectual, I don't want to say function because that sounds so cold, but it's really, it's really, really fascinating to hear all this again, because you just, you just pull from all the right expertises to knit this together very, very quickly. Whereas like for me, and I, you know, I, I, I know a little bit about this sort of stuff. It would just take me a lot longer to reach the same conclusion if I could approximate it, you know? And it, and it gets better. It gets better. So, <laughs> I, like, so um, for those who also don't know me, I not only just love ancient Greek and Roman stuff, but I specifically love Dionysian imagery. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of got into it because I looked primarily at Renaissance paintings, but was reading ancient texts, and they didn't really link up very well. Mm. And it kind of angered me, and I was like, hmm. That doesn't like make sense it's not like all happy-go-lucky joy run through a forest and drinking lots of wine like mm -hmm. um we have to also remember like these visual these visuals that we have now weren't only just visuals they were they had, had like a philosophical layer they had a theological layer because they were polytheists mm -hmm. um and i think all of that uh, is important to know when looking at the work. So image six is is one of the many I could have honestly filled up so many. I have like 20 images of just dancing satyrs in my archive. But I love I love the image of the dancing satyr because it it has mm -hmm. it has so much potential in the pose and an image in image six and six B, I was, you know, this pose at first didn't really, I didn't really understand it. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I really loved, I just loved the pose. What I did know is that like, um, through drinking, you become intoxicated mm -hmm. and and with Dionysus and the Dionysian rites, there's ecstasy. But what does ecstasy mean? Not the drug. It means to stand outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you're so outside of yourself that the physical, the physical feelings in your tangible body, you cannot feel mm. because you're outside of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so with that in mind, we'll see that a lot of poses that have to deal remotely with anything in the Dionysian sphere, there's usually a limb that is like hyperextended mm. to the point where like you really couldn't hold it because it would hurt. Mm. And so in this pose, mm -hmm you can see that the leg that's crossing over to the front and the leg that's crossing over to the back, especially the one to the back, mm -hmm. both hyperextended, the one to the back specifically more. Mm -hmm. And he, he's not only hyperextending those legs and on his tippy toes, mm -hmm. but he's also twisting. If you were to take Mm -hmm. the front view of every section of this body and stack them they would they would kind of spiral up mm -hmm. Hmm. and then i'm like okay but why though if you and and i thought about this when i was literally in the backyard uh, a couple days ago um vines oh my think god about Think about, like, just as Elysis is to water, mm -hmm. and they're mimicking the water form. Mm -hmm. I would argue that this pose, and we'll see another one too, where 
it's mimicking how a vine literally spirals up a form. Mm. Holy shit. Interesting. Like like that? hops, like hops for yeah. beer and like grapes <laughs> for wine. So yeah. you see that? Like, yeah. like starting from the end. Oh, it's like, it like blew my mind. And I was yeah. like, okay. Wow. But like, I didn't want to, I, I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> and, and in 6B, in 6B, you really see like how intense yeah that is also i don't know how totally balanced that is which is another aspect specifically in dionysian related sculpture is i mm-hmm. feel like sometimes the figures are off balance mm-hmm. obviously for mm-hmm. reasons, um but they're so slight it's so slight but that like mm-hmm. that hurts if you were to do that yeah um and I think they use the body in such a way to create that tension and all the little, all the little forms down to the digits of the toes being just as important as like the torque in his torso and seeing mm-hmm. like the serratus muscle popping out. Like all mm-hmm. those mean something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, okay, fine. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's it. And then I went and then I saw image number seven so this is a common uh, mm. story of a Dionysus as a child being transported from the knee of Zeus to some like island mountain area. Uh, so you often see him similar to like the youth of Bacchus painting by Bugra. You often see okay. Bacchus or Dionysus either as a child because he had a really kind of fucked up childhood Mm -hmm. or you see him as an adult uh like spreading the rights of Dionysus through like his country and like India which is a whole other myth but Mm -hmm. anyway so he has a child on him Mm -hmm. uh and this is a satyr, and he's doing that same twist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's still there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I have another view of this. Uh, we have a 7B. We have an image 7B, I think. 7B. Oh, that's another. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, but, you know, this one. I don't know if it's if he's unbalanced or not, but the twist is still there. Mm-hmm. And I think the fact that this was rent like this sculpture was rendered with that twist, mm-hmm. it ha- just in that motion says so much about. It has like all the layers in it. It has mm-hmm. the the intoxication of the wine being uh, outside of yourself layer. It has the nature of the satyr. Mm-hmm. in there too it has the nature of the wine um uh oh, oh there's like a ancient greek uh poem like wine takes away the troubles of men's souls mm. mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. and so you can see just in that kind of twist how much he's letting go mm-hmm and I thought that was really interesting because there's the same more or less imagery um, in 7B, but instead of a satyr carrying the baby Dionysus, it's Hermes. Mm, okay. uh, and, and Hermes is another one that Hermes is a little bit more subtle. Mm-hmm. You know, here, Hermes is very you know he's very he's almost still he's almost still Mm -hmm. uh still carrying the baby Dionysus he doesn't necessarily have the twist but there are other elements in this that tell you who he is Mm -hmm. um and there are two areas even Mm -hmm. if he didn't know the story but like just aspects of the Hermes figure here do feel like they're Hermes so Hermes is the messenger 
noted for his winged sandals mm-hmm. um, and winged hat. Now, he is wearing sandals. I don't know if there are wings on it, but if you look at his uh, right leg, uh, the one that's bent, if you look at the foot, mm-hmm. it's not all the way planted on the ground. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's important. Also, his arm that's stretched out, uh, the one that's cut off, he's looking one way. He's looking at, namely, Dionysus, but then he's signaling elsewhere. I don't know Mm -hmm. what else he would be holding. Maybe grapes, because it looks like the baby Dionysus is looking not at Hermes, but at where the arm would be or the Mm -hmm. hand. I feel like it would be grapes, mm-hmm. but I think that that foot, for me, does a lot. Um, and I think on the next slide, uh, in image eight, um, so this is another image that, or another sculpture that I mm. saw at the Archaeological Museum the same day. I saw the uh, um, the one with Athena, mm-hmm. and I again I was like, I know who it is. If we take away all the elements, all the supplementary elements that tell you that it's Hermes, namely the goat next to him, which also acts as, you know, a sculptural architectural element, mm-hmm. um, and, the, and the hat that he's wearing, if we take all that away, we can see that he's actually in movement. It's like a right? radical contrapposto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you look at that foot all the way in the back, again, mm-hmm. it's not, it's not all, like, all the digits are not on the, on the ground plane. Mm-hmm. And similarly to the stator pose, there is kind of a twist. It's really subtle here. It's more of, like, an arc. Mm-hmm. Like, we see that mm-hmm. his the foot with all feet planted or all digits planted in the ground mm-hmm. they're facing in more or less the same way that his direction of gaze is facing mm. mm-hmm. even though his torso is kind of faced more towards mm-hmm. the viewer and i feel like this does something similar to like michelangelo's david mm. in that he's about to fly Mm-hmm. Even though he's not wearing the winged sandals, it's like how do you how do you show that he's that he can fly? Mm-hmm. Even though this is made of stone, you have to kind of make it feel very light, which is why I feel that foot, that extended foot, has like just the big toe and maybe the second toe touching the ground plane. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, I think that you're right that there is some sort of kind of weightlessness to that curve that mm-hmm. that, uh, that 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 kind of starts at the foot and kind of arcs up around the contour of, of of his proper right 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 leg like there's something weird about the weight of distribution through the hips that just does not feel yeah, it, like it's like, planted it, there's yeah, something the there's yeah, something little, lifting in yeah. both of them it's right. the pelvis lifting yeah, yeah. It, he's like about to launch right yeah. Yeah. yeah about to launch and i think and i think that showed just by the fact that well a couple of facts but like Mm -hmm. i feel like just because that foot in the background is you know that knee is bent almost to and not an extreme level but it's bent but then the foot is also kicked up to the point where two little digits are touching the ground plane and he's facing us but like kind of like Mm -hmm. moving away and i think that's what this sculpture does Mm-hmm. And I feel like the 7B, it's there slightly, mm-hmm. very, 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 very slightly in that foot. Mm-hmm. And while his gaze is facing more towards Dionysus, his torso is facing right. away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, us. there's, um, 
yeah, if, if it feels like a little kind of disengaged somehow or something, it's, um, it, you know, there's something kind of removed about, about it. It's like his I hips are already it. being pulled in another direction. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's just momentarily distracted because if anything, the lift and the thrust of the pelvis in this one is more pronounced, even if the lift of the foot isn't quite as much. So right. you really, again, you get the sense of a whole plane within a major structural form and of that, the body. And that arch is built oh. there too. Yeah. Yeah. Down yeah. from like, down from like, you know, the pit of the neck. If you follow that all the way down to mm -hmm. that, uh, that knee, it's still that arc is uh, there, just as in image uh, eight. And I think that, for me, uh, oh, it just like blew my mind. But I yeah. think that's fascinating how just just those little little subtleties, mm -hmm. you, you know, from like. Is, and especially with the foot position, we can see how that foot position is almost mm -hmm. similar to how Athena's feet were positioned. Yeah, yeah, wow, in yeah. In terms of the launching off, even though she's usually pretty much standing all the time. Yeah, and and that's that's something too, or like you were saying how, you, you mentioned how it's such a, a subtle nuance between a finger that's outstretched versus curling in. It's the same thing if you... If you imagine that pelvic area as, you know, the box we were, you know, Randy McIver showed us how to break it down yeah. into, it's not just that it's moving forward, but if you were to see it from the side, it's tilting up. So it's launching away. It's not just launching forward, yeah. but rather launching. It's got a trajectory that's moving up, you know, um, almost parabolically, if you were to chart yeah. its path. Which again, you know, the Greeks knew, you know, they had, they had pretty sophisticated ideas about science and physics. So were they literally poising him to chart out on the literal, on the literal path of flight, a literal flight trajectory? I don't know. You know, it's, no. it's, it's, it's but, cool. But I find it fascinating that they, that they were able to even allude to the fact that he was flying. The fact yeah. that that Hermes sculpture feels lightweight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, He's kind of in pain where the figure of Athena doesn't feel as lightweight. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely and right. You only see like the leg, like the feet of hers, you know, and it doesn't feel as light as this Hermes does. Yeah, right. yeah. And that from me is super fascinating. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, another, I guess we'll close with. Uh, images nine and ten. So back to the Dionysian theme. Um, uh, similar to the satyr in terms mm -hmm. of stretching mm -hmm. or hyperextending uh, mm -hmm. limbs. Uh, image nine uh, is also from the Met. Uh, this also spoke to me uh, because I was super interested in how their necks were extended mm -hmm. and how they were dancing in this like strange way you know they're obviously intoxicated you can see the tiger or the leopard drinking the wine that the satyr is like pouring out because he's mm -hmm. like not paying attention yeah uh, but their necks are so far extended and again <laughs> that hurts if you were to try it mm -hmm. um and in that pose i feel like they're able to show a sort of ecstatic moment in terms of being outside of yourself and not feeling any physical pain mm -hmm. um but then you also have the notion of the pain which is also uh an aspect of dionysian narrative that's super apparent only really that i've seen in ancient greek art you don't really see it after that in the renaissance yeah um, the, the aspect of you know blood and you know killing and and murder and all of these things you don't see them mm -hmm. at all and and, and we actually. have some great comments in the chat regarding this piece um helena rota wants to know is that a maenad or you're a dicey rachel drennan okay. says that flow is like wine and then helena also adds a really interesting observation uh, yo, and then Bernini uses this for the ecstasy of St. Teresa. 
which is kind of, it's a little more sinuous, I want to say, rather than this, oh, this yeah. very, you know, this, this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. <laughs> well, no, but uh, it, it's, it's, it, I mean. Um, um, Good job, Helena. <laughs> um, I often feel like these, uh, like, you know, like these, you know, gestures, you know, that mm -hmm. you're talking about and that, you know, you're seeing as language. You know that they had explicit meaning and they were read at like you know they were read as you read them daryl um but like you know i think what people often rightly criticize you know you know greek and roman art for being is just a little you know kind of stiff and boring and i think it's because they're you know maybe focusing a little too much on you know incorporating every one of these little bit of symbols instead of just creating a naturalistic figure they're they're you know they're trying to create something that is uh that that's that you know you can read you know if you you know yeah. have have that sort of um you know knowledge base that you do mm -hmm. um but but it's but it's but but you know, as people who are making art in a contemporary world, it's good to at least know what these, uh, you know, what these symbols were, you know, initially referencing, so that like you know, if we want to borrow and steal them, we, like you know, we understand the context, we understand what they were meant to be used as, mm -hmm. and you can either you know subvert them, you can you know use them for what they were supposed to be, and try to you know use them in a more nuanced way. I I I, I think is you know this is just you know fantastic. Yes. Yeah, and then Helena just elaborated a little bit, saying um, definitely has the same out of you know definitely the same out of body experience is embodied in the head position for the for the ecstasy of Saint Teresa. Yeah, it's like all there. Yeah. yeah, and I you know I primarily look at specifically Greek art too because what the Romans did well was um, likeness. Mm, I think mm -hmm, yeah, cared, cared a lot more about likeness. Than yeah, you're absolutely more, right. Political situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, they cared so much about likeness. So what I think the Romans do is they are able to really capture subtlety and facial expression. Mm, while mm -hmm. I feel the Greeks are able to kind of have that same subtlety, but in the body. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, Helena bringing sense. up Bernini makes sense because I think like you can imagine someone like maybe Donatello, especially his or Nani de Banco's figures around Orson Michele in Florence and Michelangelo. There's yeah, a certain, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, there's a certain looking at maybe the more, um, literally sober aspect of, of ancient Greek sculpture. Whereas Bernini is looking at the more Dionysian and Bacchanalian, um, legacy in which you're so interested and invested. So that's it really does that in ecstasy of Saint Teresa though. <sighs> that's really this is really cool. This is why that's why. So yeah, sorry. I so many, keep like, keep like, like Google. If you Google dancing satyr sculpture, mm -hmm. you'll find so many. They they're literally everywhere. They have mm -hmm. this neck, and it's just like like it it hurts so much. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know with talking so much about you know the ancient world it's like okay and it's 2020 what does that mean um mm -hmm. i you know because the human body in this regard is used as grammar to create uh, a narrative theme or context that's outside of the confines of the human figure, I think, because as figurative artists, even today, we can still use this language because, like, we have absolutely the body. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, at least, I, I like to use that in my work. I think of composing, you know, composing a figure is like hard, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. because then it's like, you know, like what does it even mean though? Like, mm -hmm. why is this here? Yeah. You know, I'll often, you know, change positions of like neck, you know, millimeter by millimeter. You know, I think everything matters in that aspect. Mm -hmm. But like, but then like, how can we use this now? Uh, the last slide here, image 10, I found. Um, so this That's is by Robert crazy. Mondo. We're yeah. going to go back and forth between this one and image nine. because Okay. Really Easy. So Robert Mondo. <laughs> 
did this series of hyper-realistic charcoal drawings called mm -hmm. Men in the City. And it was inspired by, um, I think a movie he watched where these like gangsters are being shot at. Mm -hmm. And as they're being shot at, you know, they're like moving like, uh, you know, and he found that those movements were almost like a dance. Mm -hmm. And so he and his friends um, did like a photo shoot on like a New York Falcon, like a rooftop. They were throwing tennis balls and stuff at these models and like grabbing their neckties and whatever and like making yeah. them move in these like really strange ways as almost as if they were being uh, propelled by, you know, like actually like attacked by gunshots and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, obviously very violent, but also mm -hmm. it looks like a dance. So who knows? Um, I think like this image mm -hmm. is like the same sort of thing that's happening in image nine, like 100%. Mm -hmm. I, especially if you look at the right figure, the satyr, like almost the same pose, not necessarily quite, but like it's, you know, oh, like, like yeah. everything, like that neck, the way Robert Longo has that neck lodged up, the way the knees are kind of like, yeah, the feet are a little bit, man, the foot is like one foot is, you know, on his tippy toes, the mm -hmm. arm is extended out like this, along with the neck. So you yeah. have the neck and you have the strain of this area by the trapezius, like all those things, mm -hmm. I feel speak to an element of like kind of some pain that mm -hmm. I feel is going into that same out of body experience that's being portrayed in that ancient Greek sculpture mm -hmm. um, and and you see that that is something that I feel exists a lot in these Dionysian sculptures um, mm -hmm. if they're not like if they're not like super off balance because they're like drunk and they're leaning on something or someone mm -hmm. um, usually you'll see Dionysus and if you see like a sarcophagus of like Dionysus you'll know which one Dionysus is because he's going to be the one that's the most like at an angle mm -hmm. and it's not just he's about. he's just a lush like um Rachel mentions like Nietzsche's idea of Ap Apollonian versus Dionysian beauty and I was always kind of confused by that mm -hmm. argument because I kind of thought inherently uh, isn't isn't Apollonian beauty going to kind of seize the day because there's substance to it. I never associated Dionysus or, or Bacchus with, with substance, but now this lecture has made me realize that there is a transcendental, transcendental, and I'm not even, I'm, I haven't even had, yeah, there's, 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 there's a, a very, very deep element to the Dionysian. I have a end thing of that to argument. say about even the Apollonian Dionysian thing, because mm -hmm. like, when I'm looking at this stuff, I'm not thinking about a German philosopher. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that, and that was, you know, that, you know, the Nietzsche, Apollonian, Dionysian thing is a, is a lot of stuff that co came up in conversation in grad school for me. And I was like, well, that's great. But mm -hmm. we also have to realize, like, if you have, like, Apollo and Dionysus could almost be twins. Because they're both men, they're both kind of effeminate bodies, they both have long curly hair, mm -hmm. um, they both would probably skin someone alive, <laughs> you know, we have Apollo in the flag of Marseus. Yeah. We have the, uh, uh, the, um, the mangling of Pentheus in Dionysian um, mythology, so, mm -hmm. you know, same, mm -hmm. because of the kind of effeminate thing that they have with their body, they're both going to be represented in a contrapasta, but the Dionysian or the Dionysian contrapasto is going to probably be a little bit more pronounced or a little bit off balance. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think for me, that's kind of what I think about when I, when I see, when I try to think of some sort of dichotomy between the Apollonian and the Dionysian, because it's like, well, mm, they're a little too similar for me to really kind of separate mm -hmm. them. Um, or mm -hmm. yeah yeah they're a little too similar for me to separate them I, I but because they both have an order and a chaos within their realm mm -hmm. um, 
like mm-hmm. like the wine you know all the dancing and stuff like that all the Dionysian so there's an order there's an it's a it's a it's a very chaotic but strategic order mm-hmm. um while Apollo's order is more musical mm-hmm. Dionysian is arrhythmic oh that's huge Interesting. that's really huge so, so I think that that's what I think about when I try to think of like Apollonian versus Dionysian, but I don't really, mm-hmm. I don't try to group it with the, I don't really try to group it with the German philosopher Nietzsche only because I feel like it's going to be tainting this, the information that's already given to us within the realm of the ancient Greek writing that we have. And it's yeah. Access. And so like, like it's important to think about, but I would also really argue to like also think about like who, what, who is Apollo? You know, look mm-hmm. at like how, you know, at, you know, Greek deities have personalities, right? And so, mm-hmm. how do we? What does that even mean? Are they both cunning? Are they both like a little petty? Yes, they're mm-hmm. both petty people, um, and and that shows in the Contra Costa that they're represented in. Um, mm-hmm. you know the fact that you can have like an Aphrodite standing Aphrodite figure and a standing up Ap- Apollo and a standing Dionysus figure all have more or less the same type of contrapasto given more or less you know the amount of balance that's there it's kind of amazing mm-hmm. um, again it goes to that that subtlety and nuance within these slight angles like you said a finger angle. like this versus so a finger slight. like this makes all the difference so slight it's so slight and yeah and i think that's amazing um and those are those are the little little things that i that i like to pay attention to when i'm kind of either looking at ancient art or contemporary art or thinking about composing the body because then it's like well what methods or tools can I use from this type of grammar mm. that you know I can I can that that I could use to communicate an idea by mm-hmm. way of the human body mm. like mm. Um, if I want to like I don't know um oh that's a good question <laughs> I can like hear all the cogs in your brain going a million miles an hour. It's yeah. like, oh. No, it's it's it. <laughs> but it's like... See, I I I um I I come up with most of my compositions just by like you know the poses that I find okay, myself I in when I'm feeling you know feeling those feelings. But but you know being fluent in that language, you know that sort of symbolic language of different gest- of different gestures you know, could help to, you know, to solve some, you know, compositional problems, you know, when I run into issues yeah, like I think I think in the compositional problem, I think like solving them in a more grammatical way such as this could even right. open up new concepts and words that yeah. might not have been available in the immediate lexicon at hand. Right. And then, bam! You have like an entire different way of working out of things because, right. like, for me, like, like if I, like, I'm working on a self-portrait now, um, though it's mostly related to Roman, uh, in terms of the facial expression. I'm trying to relax every other aspect of my body. I mean, it's it's a bust. Mm-hmm drawing but still there's still a lot you can activate even if you're drawing from here up. Yeah, um you know i could tense a muscle i could like rotate a shoulder i could like move my head mm-hmm. i can like open my mouth or close my mouth i can like tense my jaw i could like tense up here all these things are without even getting to the lighting you know but yeah. But just in terms of the body, even up here, or there's a lot of like different types of areas for narrative potential. Mm -hmm. And and so since I'm mainly focused on my eyes, I want to calm everything else. Um, And and so I so I so I just make it all neutral. You Mm. know, I'm thinking of athena because you know with athena beside not the ones that i showed here but she's usually just standing Mm -hmm. you know nothing's activated but at the same time everything is activated Mm -hmm. and and i think that columnal aspect of athena 
is super, kind of like the sculpture in the Met. I think there's a mm -hmm. giant ass thing of Athena there. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, it's, so I think of that like columnal structure, even if I'm not actually drawing myself from head to toe, mm. you know, you can have a columnal aspect, whether you're drawing this, whether you're drawing this, you know, mm -hmm. any yeah. section of your body has potential to be something, uh, if you want to represent it in a columnal way, you can do that. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so that's something that I'm working on now in my drawing. I'm also working on like a, a commission where this guy is like burning in a, in a river of blood um and it's from the what is it from oh my god is it the uh, inferno not okay. inferno okay um and and so the challenge is like how do i compose a figure to show that he is not only in the pain and currently experiencing it but trying to flee from it and knowing that he's in the pain in the river because his past life he did some like you know fucked up shit let's mm -hmm. say you know how do we how do we represent all of that mm -hmm. in a body and 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 he's in a river mm -hmm. right so i'm only going to draw him from like the torso up right yeah but at the same time as i'm drawing the torso up i need to think about his feet yeah <laughs> you know, yeah even we don't see it even though we don't see the feet or the pelvis, those are all the things that I really have to think about in terms of composing it. Because as I'm composing where the knee might be underwater, that's gonna affect like how the shoulder is going to be moving, not only compositionally, but in terms of narratively, almost in the same way mm -hmm. as we saw like that spiral motion happen. Mm -hmm. in the right. mm -hmm. the Absolutely, um, that's that's why we, we really emphasize, you know, even if you're, even if you're you know, again, to, to the people who come in and, and work with us, like um, Ed Schiffer in the comments, he's one of he's one of the artists who comes in and works with us. And uh, when you had the the image of the 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 Robert Longo, yeah, he said, watch the nitty gritty. So everybody take note of that. Um, and and, you know, like I've, I, Ed's heard me say before, like, imagine the figure, even if you're working on a portrait, at least the rib cage extending beyond the paper. You know everything has yeah. to sit on something and mm -hmm. um and and god it's just it's it's yeah the 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 paradox is that you can't have fragmentation without prior contemplation of the whole and yes i you know i do that i do that so yeah when i fragment the figure i actually draw the entire figure mm -hmm. yeah yeah but then i'm like okay what because like i think a fragmentation I feel like there are two ways to think about fragmentation. Like you could think about fragmentation as um, uh, a life away from the whole, mm. even though it's separated, but like you could think about it as a, as a life from the whole, or I like to think about it as concentrated juice. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. So, like a full figure is cool because like it's juice right yeah but what would how would it taste if it were concentrated and more concentrated and so mm -hmm. that's the part of the delete deletion but like yeah no um yeah doing like <laughs> taking the grammar taking right. the word apart taking I, the word out Mm -hmm. I, 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 um, I, I really like the idea of the extraneous parts, maybe sometimes diluting things. So I, 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 I've, I've taken a hammer to some of my concrete castings to edit them down yeah. to be, you know, fragments, but, uh, you know, most of the time they're sculpted as complete figures. And then I realized, well, you know, I don't really need that part. It's it, like, you know, it's not really saying anything. It was there just because I exactly. felt the need to, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to compose an entire figure, but that's, that's, you know, that's not really where the composition is even saying anything. The composition is saying something and it's interesting to me, you know, in this other section. And so you can just yes. edit, you know, edit out the stuff you don't need and, 
you know, you're, you know, concentrating it, you know, you're boiling it down and, uh, you know, making it more, you know, more pure in a sense. That's an making interesting way to look at grappa. it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go with the Dionysi. Yeah. Uh, the other like, thing I realize we should do, Daryl, um, given the time oh, is again, question. yeah, if anyone has questions and in the meantime, let's show some images of your artwork so that people yes. can see proof positive um, of how you imbue these principles um so we have empire up on the screen right oh, now empire mm. <laughs> so i i think i made that when trump was elected <laughs> <laughs> uh so i was like how do we show that we're going nowhere but going backwards <laughs> But the, but the thing is, I would have I would have never gotten that reading from this. The way the lights on it, it's raking. It's kind of like, um, geez, I don't know. I think of it as as maybe maybe a wistful strip. Well, maybe this is what you're getting at. You know, a wistful stretching towards a, a a new a new day. I I I see this, and I think of maybe a little more um, growth than then then but yeah i i, I it like there's there is growth it, it's it's like a a yearning for growth okay okay that makes sense that the, the hand that's actually full is the one that's reaching back whereas the one reaching forward is not and that's not taken there. from uh orator poses and roman sculptures awesome awesome and then we actually just got a couple questions which which cropped up from ryan brooker um, the first is, and as we, as we, as you know, we answer these questions, we'll cycle through some of your drawings again, and then we can go back to those. Um, Ryan's first question is, do you feel the abandonment or lack of a commonly held cultural story hinders the effectiveness of contemporary figurative art? Is it shallow and superficial as a result? Mm. no because you could use your personal stories to really use it because at this mm -hmm. like it has like it has nothing to do with culture at this point i think it's just like i think it's more it's not necessarily about a greater cultural story it's not it's not the story it's the it's 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 fluency mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking not about the story but more about like if like if there were a greater cultural visual fluency in the human form such as this then that would in turn make the work less superficial as it is now mm -hmm. because i think you can have you can have a narrative work, you can have a figurative art be about figurative art, and then you can have a figurative art that, that is narrative. But then it has to push a little further because you know you can you could still talk about your own personal narrative, which mm -hmm. is which is like, you know, personal in that it's in your given specific time frame, which doesn't necessarily it may not lend itself to be something that is timeless or something that has further and further layers, making it less superficial. Mm -hmm. But I think that if there was, uh, if the body were used in more ways that weren't about the body, mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be, cause I don't think the, I, th I don't think there's now a, like a cultural sort of, um, like appreciation for the body outside of itself mm. um, mm -hmm. and if it i feel like if it were then things would be a little different mm -hmm. um it's changed obviously it's still changing mm -hmm. um but i feel like it's it's more on a uh, cultural fluency rather than cultural story yeah. i i uh yeah i'd like to add that i think that um, like, you know, in terms of an evolutionary perspective, our cultures are all so young that a lot of, I think a lot of this just, you know, comes from just our natural 
uh, you know, reactions to our, we, we like, you know, we tend to kind of hold and carry ourselves and gesture in ways that are just kind of inescapably human that aren't necessarily uh, affected by culture. I think there are universals amongst all humans and that, and that, um, yeah, I think that, you know, you can just add those cultural ideas on top of that, but it doesn't mean that it won't, won't be, you know, fluent, you know, without those cultural meanings. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, um, Ryan has a second question, which I think is great grounds for you to, to elaborate on. Um, are we each attempting to speak through our work in a language that no one else speaks do you think we can have a common language in contemporary figuration without a strong literary component? So each of those are two really big, big questions in one yeah. comment. So actually this drawing that you have up right now, um, uh, the mangling um, or two Pentheus, uh, mm -hmm. when I, uh, the oh the one with the red face yeah actually. got it i'm mm -hmm. back there oh uh, that one sorry that one uh when that was exhibited during my thesis crit someone called it the crucifixion pose and i commended that person even though it mm -hmm. was it had nothing to do with christianity nothing about a crucifixion but the person knew that the person was in pain mm -hmm. in the uh, and so I didn't expect anyone to understand anything remotely about like this ancient Greek myth that I've been obsessed over and this ancient Greek playwright that I've been obsessed over. Like that didn't matter for me. I think I think I needed to use I needed to use the body in a way that could communicate more bodily experiences mm. rather the narrative experiences mm -hmm. right. and I think because he understood the bodily experience of this person whose arms are like stretched out to their extreme mm -hmm. and immediately likened it to a crucifixion which on top of that if we think about the crucifixion in terms of its narrative it happened for a reason like so uh, like it someone enacted the crucifixion onto the person like he didn't do it to himself right mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that same thing happened in the myth that i'm referring to but no one knew that i didn't really care mm -hmm. um but i i think it's because we we have we because we use the human form I think we need to think of the human form outside of like more conventional symbols. But if we were to bring, if we were to take the symbols and stuff out of it and just focus on bodily experience and physical experience, then I think that is what would kind of amount to the ch like creating this like almost universal body language or something like that mm -hmm. um like a mm -hmm. common language i mm -hmm. think the common language is like is like using the body as a body but so insofar as like it will take itself out of it mm -hmm. in terms of meaning mm -hmm. like which is which is like why I hate academic art because it just does like light and shadow mm -hmm. to the point where you're just looking at light and shadow shapes that like somewhat look like a figure, you know, highly polished. It's cool, but like doesn't mean anything. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it goes back to the transcendental qualities of Dionysus. You know, there's there's something yeah, there's something yeah. else there. And then um, Helena has. Mm -hmm. Um, a question too that kind of, again really neatly fits with how you're answering Ryan's question so it's a really really good um, continuity there um, she says Daryl do you use nonverbal expression as a counterpoint to your translating work um, 
<laughs> not wait i need to break this apart oh like the like the are you referring to my written translation work like on my website or i or... will we'll give it a minute because we do have a slight bit of um a delay between our feed and then how it goes out to youtube but i i would hazard a guess that it's towards your written translation um but i i, I could be wrong i don't want to speak for helena um so we'll we'll give it a few i think like you know if if it's about my yes she says okay yes. if it's about my written translation work um yeah i process mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know actually I think when I so I'll explain I guess the process when I'm translating the work when I translate a work I you know I love the I love you know I love I love me my words I love mm -hmm. dictionaries and stuff mm -hmm. um I think literal translation is great but I also really enjoy the aspect of um paraphrasing mm -hmm. but like mm. but like paraphrasing i think now has kind of a negative connotation in that a paraphrase doesn't uh doesn't um doesn't like one who paraphrases may not understand fully the phrase that they are paraphrasing mm, okay enough to translate it um mm -hmm. in that you know a translation will probably have like more depth you yeah, know, more nuance than paraphrase. Mm -hmm. but i think a paraphrase is super vital because you can kind of feel the emotion in it mm -hmm. well and you can kind of place yourself in the in those words but not I play I like to place myself in those words not literally but um emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when I go about translating a work um I like to think about more the emotive side of things so I'll use different types of jargon I'll use like more colloquial speech I will edit things out i'll like flat out not even translate a thing similar mm -hmm. to like leaving like a leg out of a drawing because i don't think it matters in terms of understanding the entire piece like mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. like that is how i go about translating i don't know if that's i guess that is nonverbal. yeah that's emotional mm -hmm. it's kind of all in my head mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And, and, and so like, like, for example, when I translate, like when I translate like Sappho, like Sappho, like it's super, like her work is already super emotive or like Catullus, I don't like Catullus that much, but like Sappho, like Sappho, for example, like her work is so potent mm -hmm. that I don't think me translating it literally word for word is going to really get to that same potency yes okay. it is a translation mm -hmm. but i think if i were to paraphrase the the word if i were to paraphrase the word i would translate the feeling mm -hmm. and i think for me that's what matters the most because when you're reading a story you, i feel like you kind of recall it not via the literal word for word but you kind of understand the feeling that happens in the story mm -hmm. which helps you recall it yeah, you remember the concentrated juice. Concentrated juice. Mm -hmm. Concentrated juice. Mm -hmm. So that's what I that's what I kind of do with both my mm -hmm. artwork and the and the translation. I try to read it and think about. Yeah, I'll translate it word mm -hmm. for word at first. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, also to Brett, like you know, drawing or sculpting the figure in mm -hmm. its entirety, and then finding uh, where you know the true soul of that entity lies and then just getting rid of everything else yeah yeah that's really that's a really really fascinating way to work as a means of um of distillation after a certain point yeah 
you know, yeah. that's really cool. That's really, really cool. So we are, we are right at 830. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any, any questions for Daryl. Yeah. I've learned a lot because again, you know, like you hear things like Apollonian versus Dionysian and all that stuff. And they kind of like settle in the back of your head, but not until tonight have I gotten a lot more clarity on how that works and for the reasons why, not just because, you know, of what it makes me as a person feel when I look at it, but rather being able to, to appreciate its origins and its purpose by the people who first originally Again, as, as you're kind of saying, you know, kind of came up with that whole visual language itself. Um, so that's really, that's, yeah. that's really, that's really cool. And again, like, like we mentioned earlier, this is all a field into it. You know, this is, this is, this is, you, you've been doing this for a long time. You've been, I, like I was saying before the live stream, you've been like feeding us little snippets and hints of all, all these <laughs> thought processes the whole time we've known you for years now. And it's cool. Even tonight, you know, was a bit of an insight, a bit of a door opening into, you know, all this knowledge you've accumulated. So again, you know, for anyone, and well, well, everybody should, um, in the information part of this video, there's a link to Daryl's website and you're going to be doing a lot more to share this kind of information with people. So I really encourage everybody to check out your website and stay abreast of that. You have a great mailing list. Um, and how I just really want to win Powerball and then like, get you a villa <laughs> and be like, make this into, you know, because you really, you really live your artwork, you know, a lot of your aesthetic decisions, a lot of, you know, everything about, um, you know, the visuals of your everyday life are really mirrored in, you, well, that they mirror a lot of what you think about, which is really, really cool. And again, probably a very, um, something that you would have made a lot of, uh, at least someone like Andrea Montaigne. I think he was known for, for dressing up and like, you know, like Roman robes and hanging out with other artists dressed up like figures from antiquity or something like you would have made them very jealous. So <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other discussion. We could have like your take on someone like Andrea Mantegna or your take on someone like Donatello or Brunelleschi who spent time in Rome. And again, like you were saying, Renaissance just means rebirth. You know how they kind of got these ideas, um, not just in a visual art sense, but also in a humanist sense, and and really, right. we're we're spearheading. And and again, like you'd mentioned specifically, sculpture, sculpture is something that really drove the Renaissance into existence. Mm. So that's probably again like a whole other, whole other, other. yeah. I yeah. could talk y'all's ear off on how I feel about the Renaissance, so I can go <laughs> century by century. <laughs> Artist oh, like, by artist, like we can decode George R. Vasari's book. Oh. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to uh, we'll have to schedule uh, we'll have to schedule um, um, another uh, an, an, another 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 live stream uh, at some point no. in the future. Yeah, yeah. This is this is really great. So I I don't see any other. Um, questions cropping up we've had such a great rapport though throughout like when you go back and look at the chat as i'm sure well, or you've been looking at you know you can yeah, see yeah. the comments has been real that have been really really great yeah. and really yeah. it's been great to have all of you here and um um uh, chiming in we uh we really do appreciate the audience feedback it uh it's 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 um it's a lot of fun to be able to, you know, provide this, you know, to the internet and, you know, get to reach people and And again, talk to a big honor for us, Daryl, that like, this is where you, you've, you've shared more about all, this is a huge, like, behemoth oh, of God. knowledge you've been <laughs> accumulating. So I think with that being said, we're going to end the stream, but we're going to keep our Zoom thing live so we can hang out for a few more minutes. Um, but again, to everybody watching, thank you guys so much. Make sure to check out Daryl's website and all his work. It's really incredible to see someone. Um, and especially because you, you don't necessarily blindly follow the path of whom you're studying and looking at, but rather you're very, very astute and looking at it through a 21st century lens. 
and and your artist statement speaks to that very very eloquently and other reads you guys can find that on his website it's really worth reading because i think it's a very especially in this particular date and time given what's going on in current events i think your outlook daryl is a very respectful but very um but it's a very respectful way of looking at the past without denying the time during which we live. And I, I just think it really hits all the right notes in terms of in terms of that attitude and approach as well. Because I feel people either going to, you know, they go too far in one direction or they go too far in the other. And again, going back to subtlety and nuance, you look at things not just as, as a split binary, but rather you know, that human element, you look at the lexicon of things, you know, so it's really, really important, especially now, especially now. So, especially now. So, all but, right. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank thanks. For, so much. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see you guys. We'll have Daryl back and we'll see you guys soon. <laughs>